Hi guys, I'm Sean Cantwell and welcome back to season two of Scaling Success, a podcast geared towards entrepreneurs where we discuss a range of topics that contribute to building a valuable and long lasting business. If you're new to the podcast, please give us a follow on Spotify and YouTube. We have a great guest for you today. I'm thrilled to welcome Sam Sherman, founder and CEO of Broker Genius, a price optimization technology business for the live event industry. Sam is an incredibly bright and scrappy entrepreneur who had an idea and turned it into a profitable business with hundreds of customers. And then the pandemic hit. The live event, is, live event industry shut down completely with the onset of COVID-19, and that led to serious challenges for the entire industry. Entrepreneurship is sometimes glamorized in our society, but it can also be incredibly hard, even in good times. I'm excited to talk to Sam today about managing through a crisis and how he was able to manage that and also position the company for a bright future on the other, on the other side of you know, what were very challenging times. By way of background, Volition Capital is an investor in Broker Genius, so I have gotten to know Sam quite well over the past four plus years. Sam, welcome to the podcast. Uh, if you would, please introduce yourself and, and share some, some background on, on Broker Genius, if you would. Thanks. Sure, sure. Thank you for the intro, Sean. Thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, so my name is Sam Sherman. I'm the CEO and founder of Broker Genius. Um, I started, um, started the company in 2013 after having kind of dabbled uh, in the business myself as a uh, kind of an amateur ticket broker for, for a year prior to that. Um, so back in 2012, I had a bunch of friends and family members um, that were kind of buying and selling season tickets and, and having success. Um, and um, that, was kind of, that was attractive because I really I loved sports. Um, and I also uh, love data and marketplaces and kind of the interse intersection of all that was uh, seemed like a really cool opportunity. So back in 2012, um, I was working full time um, for an out of home media company um, in business development and sales. And um, I was looking for, for an opportunity to kind of just, you know, go into the market. And um, this was right when Peyton Manning was coming back from uh, from injury um, and he was going to sign with either the Broncos or the 49ers. And I called up uh, the Broncos ticket office um, <clears throat> like a day or two before he ended up signing um, and kind of thought maybe he would sign there and, and got a list of all the inventory that was available, which was down to only like very expensive premium club inventory. And um, basically um, was just kind of asking uh, this rep um, if he, he could give me any kind of uh, inside information, like was it unofficial or whatever. And ultimately he's like, listen, as soon as it's, if it's going to happen, I'll send you an email and maybe that'll be like an hour before ESPN picks it up. And that's what happened. I still have that email framed on my wall. The, the, the subject line was, it just happened. So I call him up and um, I, uh, I maxed out all of my credit cards on Broncos tickets. Um, and that's how I got started. And so ultimately, um, as I started to buy, buy more and more inventory, um, you know, I, I started to see a lot of inefficiencies in the market, um, particularly around pricing, because even though I was making it like a, a really nice amount of money and good margins, but I also saw that I was oftentimes leaving a lot on the table. Um, and that's basically how Broker Genius, uh, you know, evolved from there. That's amazing. Your entrepreneurial story is similar to many entrepreneurs I've met and ones that we've invested in that you just saw a problem and an inefficiency in the market and you decided to solve it. A lot of people see problems and inefficiencies and have ideas, but don't necessarily have the follow through to actually commit and start a business and take on all the challenges um, that go along with, with building a business. Have you always been an entrepreneur? Uh, or were you kind of an accidental entrepreneur in this case? Um, so I would say I was, I was always an entrepreneur at heart. Um, I, I knew it was from the time I was a kid. Um, my, my older sister tells the story when, when I was uh, a six or seven, we were living in Memphis, Tennessee. And apparently I convinced her that the pine cones in the back in our backyard were, were very valuable um, and were <laughs> uh, these scented, special scented uh, leaves. So um, we went door to door trying to sell them. So I, I got my first failures also very out of the way very quickly too. But I, I think I always had that kind of entrepreneurial spirit. 
Um, and, um, and I had been involved with, from the time I was like, you know, 19, 20 years old, um, in many different types of startups. Um, many of them were complete failures. Some of them had some moderate levels of success, but it put me in a position and on a track um, to A, do what I knew I always wanted to do, which was to become a, a successful entrepreneur, hopefully at some point. Um, and also it really to, to learn from um, all those different mistakes and failures that I had had over time, which um, you know, certainly helped, helped me to get to where, where we are now. How would you describe, Sam, what it means to be an entrepreneur and some of the, the traits that are necessary for success? Yeah, so I mean, I think the first thing, um, the first thing is to me bearing the risk and the responsibility, um, because I know a lot of really talented and smart people that that would say I never, I never want to own my own business, and and the number one reason that I hear from people um, is that they just don't want that that stress and that um, that you know that responsibility and, and to take that risk. And so I think that the first thing is being able to bear the risk and the responsibility. Like that's a prerequisite, I would say, to being a, an entrepreneur. Um, the, the other thing is, I, to me, it means being able to take a vision um, and to turn a vision into a reality. And you spoke about this a little bit earlier about, you know, the execution is kind of the, the main difference um, between a lot of people have good ideas, but it's execution. And I think that like having having the vision, but then just being able to like figure it out and how to hack it, you know, of, okay, I got to get from A to B. How do I do it? I've never done it before. I'm going to do a little research. I'm going to talk to people. We're going to figure it out. We're just going to do it. So it's, it's the drive to turn the vision into, uh, into a reality. Um, and then also there's leadership that, that is required. Um, and so um, it's sometimes uncomfortable, but being, putting yourself in a position to be a leader and, and being a leader, I think is really important um, and, um, and I, like I said before, I think the most important thing uh, to me about being an entrepreneur is to, is to really believe um, that success comes from failure um, and that learning from mistakes is, is really how you end up, you know, hopefully achieving greatness over time. Um, I don't think there's another possible way to do it other than that. And I think that's the, the number one hallmark of, of being an entrepreneur. And I and just on that note, I, I just recently watched this document, documentary on Elon Musk and SpaceX and going back, going to the space station. I, I watched that too. Yeah. And, and I thought it was amazing um, to, to hear him to, to contrast NASA's approach um, versus, uh, versus SpaceX approach and, and Elon Musk's approach and everything that he does. Where, where he says the same thing, that failure is an integral part of, of success. Um, and, um, and to me, it's just, it's something that I've, I've seen you know, so, so clearly so many times. So to me, that's the number one. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So you talk about kind of the responsibility and stresses sometimes that go along with being an entrepreneur. Talk to us a little bit about March, 2020 and how that change your life. We talked a little bit about Broker Genius uh, and how it was impacted by the onset of the pandemic, but maybe just describe for the audience how yeah. that impacted the business and you know, really the next two years leading up to this point uh, since then. Yeah. So, um, so our broker genius is revenue. Um, as, as you mentioned before, we are a, an automated dynamic pricing technology, a pricing optimization technology for event ticket sales for ticket resellers. So 100% of our revenue is tied to event ticket sales. Um, so, uh, on, you know, over the two or three weeks prior to March 11th, um, we had obviously, all been, you know, again, I think everybody, everybody remembers what it was like a little bit before COVID hit. And I, I remember, first of all, just looking back, like how naive I was in terms of like all the signs and, and the writing was on the wall. Um, but I really just, and I don't think I was alone in this. I really kind of felt like somehow this was going to be, have a very minor impact um, in the United States. Um, and um, on March 11th, um, I was in the office with uh, with John John Lucier, my my CFO, and um, you know who without him I would not have been able to get through this. But uh, we were we were on March 11th, kind of just planning. Nothing. We weren't like concerned. We were just kind of like starting to look at hey, 
do, do we need to adjust our numbers? You know, we had a forecast. Do we kind of need to like recalibrate a little bit? Maybe we need to take down our 2020 goals by about 10 to 15 percent. Like that's how we were thinking about it on March 11th. Uh, and um, we were it was about six or so, I think six or seven o'clock in the evening. Um, and all of a sudden, we, I get a ping on my phone that Rudy Gobert had just tested positive for COVID and they just postponed the game. And that was, I, I remember watching um, a documentary on the, uh, the Columbia shuttle disaster where um, in the room, the, the, you see all the NASA people and the director's like, shut, lock the doors. And like that lock the doors moment was, that was what it was like for, for John and I, um, where all of a sudden, like, like that, it was going from, do we need to adjust, you know, budget and forecast by 10% to, are we like literally going to have to just cut a majority of our staff like immediately? Um, and that was, I mean, that we just came on so sudden. It was like so surreal. Um, but that's basically how, how it all started for us on March 11th. Um, definitely never, we'll never forget where I was when that happened. I can, uh, I think probably short, shortly after the, lock the doors moment. I remember getting a call from you and John, I was in an airport yeah. in Salt Lake city airport. I can still remember. And you mentioned that uh, Rudy Gobert had tested positive and then the NBA, obviously shortly thereafter decided to suspend play. Um, yeah. So that did, uh, that did uh, certainly change, um, you know, the, the projections for that year and, and beyond. So this is a perfect example, Sam, of, the unexpected realities and challenges that go along with the burden of wearing the crown, <laughs> you know, and being the guy in charge. And you have responsibilities to a lot of people, your investors, your employees, your customers. What's your next move? How do you think about the path ahead and really prioritizing the large number of things that need to be addressed and put into action? Yeah. Um, so I think, like I said, the, the first thing was like just coming to grips with like, this is not a movie and this is like, this is reality. Uh, and then it was very quick into action mode. Um, and I think that in many ways, some of the challenges that we had been through prior to COVID really prepared, you know, in a way, John and I for making the hard decisions um, where I was not prepared prior to that. So I, I think that in hindsight, that was actually some of those challenging times, again, prior to COVID, where we had, had gone through different, you know, high growth, and then we had to, then we had some, you know, contraction, and we had to adapt then. And so that kind of prepared us for like getting into action mode and just being like, okay, we're taking a hard look at the numbers. How deep do we need to cut? And really like looking at it from a, just, we got to preserve cash. We got to be able to survive. So the first thing was, here's how much money we had in the bank. And at the time, we had the equivalent of about three months of cash compared to what our March, our March 2020 overhead was. So if, if like if we had no revenue, that means we were out of cash in three months. And at that point, we knew that revenue was going to zero, like the next pretty much the next day. Um, and so we had no idea how long it was going to go to zero. And that was part of the challenges was like in, in the beginning, no one really knew, even if you were taking a brutally honest uh, look at things, no one really knew how to forecast because obviously we had the responsibility of and felt the responsibility of all of our staff, our employees. Um, we obviously did not want to cut, you know, and didn't certainly didn't want to cut deep. Um, and so that was, that was basically how, how that would drove everything was, Here's the cash number. We need to come up with what we think today is a realistic model for how long events are going to stay at zero. And what does that mean to cash? And how deep do we need to cut? And what are we going to do with everybody else during this time? Um, and so like, that's, that's kind of what, you know, uh, how we spent our time early on. Um, but um, so on the, on the one hand, we were looking at surviving and not going into bankruptcy. On the other hand, we were also then looking at, okay, well, we're, we're doing this so that on the other side, we're going to have a business. And so if we're going to do that, 
We also need to make sure that we have the right people that are still going to be with us, that we can rebuild the business, hopefully, whether it was three months or four months at the time, we thought maybe three to four months, five months. Um, we certainly did not think it was going to be well over a year with no with no live events. But um, that's kind of how how, you know, so it was cutting deep, um, preserving cash and making sure that we have the right talent and, and can keep the, the right people on the other side of things. Um, that was, you know. That's how we kind of... Uh, we're, so we're, Sam, you talked about some of the just tactical things you needed to face head on. And in some cases, maybe it was obvious, but there's also people involved. And I know you well enough to know you're a very empathetic person. Uh, you have a high e- IQ. You also have a high EQ. And just as a leader, sometimes you're forced to make hard decisions. And how do you manage that balance between doing what you know intellectually is the answer and perhaps the only answer with just making hard decisions and sometimes separations with people you've had emotional connections with. Yeah, that's a really hard one, Sean. Um, one of the, probably the hardest thing for me that I've had to learn over um, the last nine years or so um, was being able, was that in order to be successful um, to be an entrepreneur did not just mean like riding the waves during the good times of growth um, and that separating emotions. Um, I, I certainly made many mistakes in the past where I let emotions make the wrong decision for me in terms of, you know, the wrong promotions or um, not acting quickly enough for, for you know, a, an employee that wasn't the right for, for, the, for the company or something, anything that really was a difficult decision along those lines. Um, and so I, I would say in general, um, I kind of just learned how to, uh, you know, at a certain point, you do have to kind of turn it off a little bit. You have to just look at things, you know, from here's the decision. I've got to make the decision, obviously always treating people with respect, but like there's a determination, this needs to be done and you just got to go do it. Um, and so, you know, once you kind of are, are forced into that a, a, a few times, you, you know, you get better at it and you kind of learn from it. Um, when you're having to make a decision like that, that involves termination or something along those lines. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's certainly the, for me, still the most difficult thing, you know, um, as a, as a CEO. Sam, you know, I am, I, I have, um, I sit in a very fortunate seat where I get to meet a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of starting businesses and a variety of different industries. And one of the things I admire most about entrepreneurs is just the ability to see opportunity and pursue that opportunity irrespective of the resources available to you at that point in time and the ability to maintain optimism and find answers to problems as they present themselves. I think as an investor, and this is true of many investors, I've said this before, we're really good at looking at a situation and identifying all the reasons why it's going to fail. The entrepreneur actually has to find answers uh, and figure out how you're going to turn those failures into successes. And my question for you is when you're in the tunnel, the depths of these really challenging times, you got three months of cash and gosh, okay, you got to make reductions. You also got to figure out how to finance this business uh, for the indefinite future. Where did you find the strength and the optimism to see the bright side? right? And continue to envision a business that could succeed and thrive on the other side of what was a very unfortunate and unpredictable event. Um, yeah. So I, I would say probably the number for me, the number one anchor um, was my wife during the time. Um, it was obviously on a very personal level, you know, we had really all of our, um, really everything tied to, to this business. Um, and so there was really not much of a safety net outside of Broker Genius. Um, and so, um, you know, my wife's being re- really just the, um, not just the voice of reason and encouragement, but also like, I was, it was like, she, she, she it wasn't a question to her, like, we're like, we're getting through this. Like, so a lot of it was feeding off of that. But then from, from internally, um, I also, I also just did see I did see this as something that if we can just survive, I really see opportunity on the other side of the horizon because there was all this disruption that was going to happen in the industry, all these different participants and market share was going to change and all these different things were going to change. 
And, and as I've seen over the course of the years that I've been doing this change, it, it's scary, but it also leads to big opportunities. And I felt like we were strongly positioned if we could survive. So just the, I think it was the belief in the belief that there was going to be a brighter day. Um, and, and there were a lot of dark times. So it wasn't like I felt that all the time, but always I would come back to that, that we're going to get through this. And, and uh, you know, there's, there's going to be a much brighter day on the other side of things. Well, you're very fortunate to have a strong woman by your side. She is a very wise woman. I know I have not had the good fortune of meeting her, but uh, on the many occasions where you have referenced her advice, I always, I always find myself thinking that is awesome advice. That is spot on. Yeah. Um, yeah so it's always, it's always great to be surrounded by folks that, you know, kind of help you persevere through some of those, those more challenging times. I guess if you, if you, from, from your vantage point sitting here today in May of 2022, um, what are some of the moves you made, you know, over the last couple of years that you think were impactful uh, towards positioning the company uh, for success once live events did return? Yeah. So, I mean, I think there's, a, there's really a few major things. Uh, the first was that um, as hard and as unfortunate as it was that we had to cut about 80% of our staff, where we, where we were at the time was then thinking about the 20% that we were going to just ride this out with. Um, and of course, in doing so, you're, you're really looking to keep all of your A players, um, the people that are just the, the creme de la creme. Um, and so that was very unique because it was the first time afterwards when we had made those decisions, gotten through the worst of it, that all of a sudden, as the market started to rebound and our volume started to come back to 20%, 50%, 100% of our levels, and all of a sudden we were able to do with way less staff what took way more people before by having just, you know, awesome, the just the best of the best. And it also, from a cultural perspective, and again, I, I would say this is, we're, we're just, again, this is one of the fortunate, you know, fortunate um, benefits on, on having been on the other side of this, because nobody's going to do this proactively, but it created a culture to where everybody was so um, passionate and, and so like, you know, believed in the company so much after having gone through that together. And also everybody carried their weight so much that the accountability that everybody had towards each other wasn't something you had to tell people. It was just something that that's the way we do things here is that we're all going to jump in. We're just going to figure out, we're going to be great. We're going to get through this. We're going to grow. Um, and that the, the culture changed as, as a result. So we became leaner. we just became just, you know, a much more talented workforce. Um, and um, I, that, that's still paying dividends to, uh, to today. So that's one major, that's the first, I think. And, and number one, also, I was really fortunate to, um, because of COVID in many ways, um, do a merger with another company in our space. Um, and that merger was critical to our success today. Um, and my new partner, Drew Gaynor, um, which was the founder of the company that we merged with, Seed Scouts, um, you know, I don't think it ever would have happened um, outside of COVID. Um, and that's, that's paying huge dividends for us as well. Um, and, and so being a, again, a, a much more, much more lean, a much more talented um, organization, having the combination of this other company um, with these raw pieces that, that positioned us for, uh, you know, for success. Those are, uh, those are really interesting insights. I agree with the point on the merger. Sometimes those challenging environments create opportunity. Uh, and you had to get, need to have the conviction to act on it, uh, you know, and in this case you did and, and Drew did. And I think it's been a good partnership. Uh, you mentioned an interesting point how, you know, there's the unfortunate reality of a head headcount reduction. Uh, you then have a leaner team, live events come back, volume comes back and you find yourself delivering the same productivity which, with a much smaller team, which leads to, you know, much higher profit generation. Uh, at the outset, Sam, you mentioned that, you know, part of being an entrepreneur is learning from your failures and taking those and getting better. What advice do you have for entrepreneurs that, that perhaps, you know, they raised a round of financing and they're ready to scale up the organization? Um, what lessons did you learn that you would apply the next time about how you would think about how quickly to scale the organization 
and perhaps how you would try to maintain that scrappy culture, startup culture as you get bigger? Yes. So um, it's a great question. I I was actually recently having a one-on-one with uh, one of the members of, uh, of my team um, that was, that's been with, it's been with the company now for, for, I think about seven, seven or eight years. And, and so has seen the company through many different iterations, extremely high growth, retraction, back to high growth, COVID, then high growth again. And one of the things that, um, that he said to me that I, I, that I I think is really true is that he, he was saying that this feels different because we're growing like we're, we're doing really well, thankfully right now, but it feels like it's sustainable growth. It really like, it's just, this is coming from just someone that's not necessarily privy to everything on, on the executive level, but just, it feels like we're growing really responsibly with, with sustainability. And in the past, um, you know, I, I think Sean, it might've been you. It's, uh, you know, I, I remember hearing growth covers up a lot of things. Um, high growth covers up a lot of things. And, and I know that that to be the case, because it's like, you know, when the numbers, when you're growing like a rocket ship, that's all anybody's going to focus on. Nobody's going to care about the problems then. But as soon as those things are gone, those problems are going to surface very, very fast. And it's really easy to lose sight um, of things that are problems that, you know, it, it's like, you know, um, I remember once comparing it to right before you, you, you need to have the root canal. It's like you had that nagging feeling in your tooth. Maybe I should get this checked out. There might be a cavity and just kind of put it off. And then at a certain point, now you need a root canal, you know? Um, so, you know, it, it's kind of like when, when, even during the high growth times, when you know, when you know, and, and only, an entrepreneur, only an entrepreneur knows, like, you know, when you know, but if you know, and it's like in the back of your head and you're just putting things off and not dealing with them, it's going to come back. It, to me, in my experience, it's always come back to hurt me worse versus just dealing with it. Then, if you have something that's not going right, you got to pause, deal with it, and then move on. Even when you're in the high growth, uh, you know, in high growth mode. Um, so, to me, like that's like the number one lesson. I think. Does does um, you know when when you first have success, it's exciting. And heck, in some ways, it's maybe a metaphor for the last 10 years. There's this bull market run and heck, there's a lot of investors and entrepreneurs, everything they do, it works, right? And then you have a failure and it kind of changes your perspective. Um, Have you noticed that your perspective has changed and perhaps, you know, do you find yourself taking a more balanced approach towards certain puzzles that you're trying to solve? Yeah, definitely. I I think that... um... You know, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have a very talented board, um, which I, I, I only started appreciating after having a board. Like, quite honestly, when we first put the board together, it was because kind of I had to put a board together for governance and whatever. And then after seeing the impact that some board members were actually making, and you know, Sean, because you're on my board, um, and, and seeing the advice that they're able to give and being really giving a different perspective, um, I think that, you know, in many ways, um, you know, early on in different situations, I wasn't willing to, um, you know, I was a little too optimistic at times, right? And and that's, that's uh, I think, the other side of, of usually, I think it goes, not every time, but probably very often it goes along with that entrepreneurial spirit is to see the glass, glass half full, which is a good quality, but not at the expense of not seeing reality. And so kind of learning um, how to balance that and, and really taking a, a, a hard look at things um, is certainly something that took time for, for me. It wasn't, it wasn't, you know, first, uh, first, it was second nature. You know, it wasn't second. It took, it took a little bit more. And then, you know, uh, so I, I would say that that's, that's kind of like something that's always stuck out is, is that I, I was, I was able to learn from, from that with the board and take, I take the, the, um, the more balance to you. You're saying as the per, as my perspective changed, it's changed in that way. When I'm looking at things, I'm really trying to make sure that I'm not being like overly optimistic um, and, and taking a, a hard look. And then also making sure that I'm asking the advice of people that aren't sitting in my seat and might see it from, and often do see it from a different point of view. And then taking that feedback and kind of incorporating it into finally my, my, uh, my point of view. So, yeah. 
So Sam, the, uh, you know, you mentioned March, 2020 and Rudy Gobert testing positive and everything that ensued after that and revenue going to zero for a period of time, you know, at Volition, when we're looking at the year over year growth comps for our portfolio companies, you know, there was a rough patch there because you had a high growth, profitable business uh, whose end market just disappeared. Now live events have come back and you're on the other end of that scale. <laughs> you know, one of the highest growth companies in the year over year growth is exceptional and each month is better than the, the next. Uh, maybe just describe for our audience a little bit um, the industry you play in and just live events in general. What is the state of live events? Probably most of our uh, listeners and viewers are perhaps thinking about summer concert series or attending uh, football games. What is the kind of state of the industry today? Yeah, so the, the state of the industry right now is extremely healthy. Um, the numbers that we're seeing right now, both on the consumer the consumer demand side, and then also the lineup of new events, you know, new tours, artists that are coming out, um, it is is phenomenal. So again, there's there's a lot. Um, you, you need both sides, right? You need strong consumer demand. You also need a lot of people to be going on and, and, and having events. Um, and that's leading right now to the highest profitability that we've ever seen in the industry. Um, in, in fact, like we just did an analysis on, on, our, on our quarterly board meeting where we looked at over the last five months, pre-COVID to now in, in concerts um, and margins were uh, 36% now. And at the same time, pre-COVID, they were about 29%. So the, the, uh, the industry is selling, the tickets are selling at the highest prices that we've ever seen. Even when you factor in for inflation, they're still sell, selling at the most profitable they've ever been. Um, and so I think that that shows the, the, I guess a lot of people would call a pent up demand from COVID. I think though, even before COVID, um, the, there was a, a growing uh, desire, a growing willingness and desire for, for, um, for people to spend money on live experiences. Um, and live entertainment. And, and I think that that certainly there is a pent up demand element to it. But I think that we're starting to get past the pent up demand, you know, phase of like, hey, live events are back. It's like a novelty again. It's like we're kind of, you know, at the tail end of that. And yet still we see tremendously strong uh, demand. So I think that, that, again, consumers are willing to pay for experiences. Um, and we, we see that as a as a continuing trend. Um, I don't think that that's going to be replaced by digital or AI. I think people need live experiences, um, and so um, and so overall, we feel we feel very optimistic about the state of the uh, of the event industry. Great, and Sam, your customers are profi- professional ticket brokers. Uh, you talked a little bit about the industry. Um, what's in store for your customers and the target market going forward? What message do you have for them? So I think that, you know, the message, first of all, is that, you know, everybody, we all went through this together. So we all went through really hard times together. So it's very gratifying to see our customers being very profitable right now. Remember, they're making up also for a year plus of zero revenue too um, and zero profitability. So um, so we're really happy to see their success and their success is certainly part of our success. Um, and we see that, you know, it, right now our focus is to enable our clients to have the best automation in the industry so that they can continue to grow and that we can all continue to grow together. Um, so we, we've got some really cool um, technology coming out right now. It, it's been it's really it's uh, it's exciting for me on the data side of things. We've been focused so long on harnessing the power of our data to be able to provide benefits for our customers. And we're very close to launching some game-changing technology that will totally change the way that event tickets are priced. So we're, 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 we've already shared some of that with them, um, but it's going to be a really exciting three months of our roadmap as we are starting to come out with some of this new technology. All right, great. Well, I do have an advanced view into some of that, and I think your customers should be excited. One thing I've shared with you, Sam, but I'll also share for, with our audience is... Uh, Many lesser entrepreneurs would have given up, (laughs) you know, when faced with the set of circumstances you faced, uh, the prospect of zero revenue for an extended period of time, three months of cash, as you mentioned, uh, you know, and you were able to endure, you know, an extended period of time with no live events, you managed to put together a merger, which really strengthened the product roadmap, 
Uh, you got the company financed. You made personal sacrifices in order to help do that. And uh, it's really exciting and satisfying from my vantage point uh, to see you experiencing some of the success that, that you deserve. And uh, I know really at the root of all of that is, you know, your commitment to the industry and your customers and the, the hope and intent to provide them with a really good experience and enable them to, to improve their businesses and, and generate more profits. So um, thank you, Sam, for sharing some of your personal experiences. Uh, and, you know, I think and I hope, you know, our listeners will benefit from that. Uh, as I mentioned, sometimes entrepreneurship is glamorized, but heck, I spend a lot of time with entrepreneurs and there's a lot of sleepless nights. There's a lot of stress uh, that goes along with it, um, you know, but it's as, as much about the journey as it is the, the destination. So thank you For so sure. much. Sam. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Sean. All right. Take care.